Thanks so much for joining us. This is an absolute special day for me. One of my favorite musicians in the entire world is here. Victor Wooten, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> I'm so honored, Corey. Thank you for having me. It was so fun to play music together. <laughs> you telling me, yes, it was. And I knew it would be. I'm a fan of yours, so I knew it would be a lot of fun. Oh, well, thank you. That really means a lot. It really means a lot. I've listened to your music since I was a kid, and I don't say that to make you feel old. I say it to let you know that your music has impacted me for well, the majority of my life. I, I appreciate that. And, and be, be, for me, being old is a gift. You know, a lot of people don't make it. Mm. So I'm honored to, to be old. Yeah. You know, and when I... When I was a kid, you know, I thought, I'm 56 now, I thought 56 was ancient, <laughs> you know. So I'm honored to be here, you know, because um, as we get older, we get things that younger people can't, can't get, like, which is experience. Yes. Doesn't mean we're better than anyone, but you can't buy our experience. You can't download it. There's no app for it, you know, and I'm happy that I have some of that. I've, I've been able, lucky to get to do a lot, and now I can add playing with you to the list. Oh, thank you. <laughs> that is very kind of you. Today's episode is all about bass. I want to get into some things about you and your approach to life and music sure. and get a little more perspective about your books, ah, okay. which I love. Thank you. We'll get there in a second. But I want to start talking about the bass because the bass is an interesting instrument where there seem to be several schools of approaching how bass gets used. Sure. When I was growing up, my favorite bands were... Red Hot Chili Peppers, The Flectones, and Primus. Wow. <laughs> there was okay. an era where that was my three yeah. bands. Yeah. And DMB. D at DMB, uh, Stefan's a little more of a sleeper ace of a bass player. But as far as Flectones, Primus, Red Hot Chili Peppers, if those are a person's favorite band, mm -hmm. their expectation of what a bass player's role in the band is very different sure. than a lot of people who think, Oh, the bass is just the, the thing to play the roots and give a little foundation and the whole notes on the bottom and maybe a little thumping. As somebody who's been kind of an ambassador for high-level musicianship on mm -hmm. the bass, how do you try to teach people about what the bass is capable of? There, there's a few ways that I, that I share, share that information. One way to think of the bass is like the foundation of this building that we're in. I'm sure nobody walked in here today and said, wow, this, this floor is really nice. It's solid. I'm glad it's <laughs> holding everything up, right? When you're doing your job, you're going to be like Stefan. No one's really going to notice, right? Now, the other three bands, Flectones, Chili Peppers, right, Les Claypool, we, we stand out a little bit more. Stefan's doing his job in the back, yep. which is the era before me coming up. That's all they did. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about uh, you know, Chuck Rainey, Lee Sklar, James James, and Carol Kay, we just supported the band. Now, as we get a little bit of ability on the bass, we still have to support the band, but we, we get a chance to take more solos and things like that. But we can't lose our role. If I explain it the way my brother Reggie taught us, music is, is uh, melody, harmony, and rhythm. And the bass and the drums are the foundation of that rhythm. And they each have different roles. And for the younger bass players coming up, if we learn to do the flashy things on the bass without having that solid foundation, it's like building a roof without the floor and wondering why the roof won't stay up, mm. right? So the foundation has to be there so that you can build up, like you, you bake a cake before you ice it. You yes, know? Yeah. I love that. So what is the order of operations for a bass player just looking to get from beginner sure. to advanced. It's easy these days. You listen to the beginning people who played the bass, right? Who were the first people to play the bass? Some of them are still alive, okay? Chuck Rainey, one of my heroes, is older than the electric bass. Okay, the electric oh, bass. Oh, I never thought yeah, of yeah, that. Yeah, think about it. He's older than the electric I bass. I never thought of that. So the pioneer, this, this is like, for me, living in the days of the Wright brothers. So we can be attached to the very beginning of this instrument. Now the double bass, acoustic bass, goes back further, which is where this came from. Yeah. Jamerson played the double bass. Chuck Rainey didn't. He went straight to electric. So this is a new instrument. So it's not hard to find the beginning mm. of where and why and when. 
and then we're attached to it and we build from there. And uh, with the internet now, it's, there's never been an easier time. Probably even when you were young, we had to buy records. We had to wait for the band to come to town. Now we push a couple buttons and it's all in our lap. Right? Yeah. Everything we want to see is right in front of us. But we had to search for it, which was a gift. Because if yeah. we wanted to get good, we had to practice. Nowadays, we want to get good. We dial it up on the internet and we want someone to teach us. Mm. Different attitude. They both work, but a different attitude. But um, we're, you know, to, to get back to your question, you go back to the beginning of who played it first, right? Because even the music of the day is built upon the music of yesterday. Of course. And the music of yesterday had simple bass lines, note wise. But there's a whole history and lesson in every bass part, you know, and, and the, some of the simplest parts. You know, Papa was a Rolling Stone, that bass line. Simple. But there's a whole, you know, at least half a year of college worth that you could study just in that bass line. But in many cases, we're going to learn the Victor Wooten flea solo stuff first. Yeah. Before we've learned what we call the basics. <laughs> <laughs> I like yeah. that. Yeah. What are some exercises sure. that the people that are very technically proficient have the roof? What are some things that they can do to build the foundation? First, what, one of the things I do is, is in a nice way, try to point out what the person's gifts are first. Absolutely. To make them know that you're, you're on their side. But then you kind of let them know that there's some holes in their game. At my music camps, and I have a group of people, I can tell who's gigging and who's not. I get the guys that want to impress me and play my stuff, which, you know, I thank you, that's great. I, I can't even play it that well, thank you for that. But I say, how many bands are you in? They say, well, none, I just practice. And then I go to this young lady over here who's grooving. How many bands are you in? Three. How old are you? 17. And I look at the first guy. He gets it right away. Oh, right? You got to play bass lines to get in bands. The only band that wants Victor Wooten, I've already got that job. <laughs> so, you know, you know. So the, the, the one thing that I, I have people do is go back and learn some early, simple bass lines. Play them for minimum 15 minutes. Don't add a thing. Mm. Just so you know you can. Yeah. And now write me five other bass lines similar to that. Yeah. Because the art of coming up with great bass lines is, is, is it's almost like the art of being a rhythm guitarist. Sure. You see it dying. Mm -hmm. And when someone like you or Sonny or somebody comes out and it's like, wow. It's like, I, I didn't even know I was thirsty, mm. but this is quenching my thirst, you know? For me, the best way of teaching anything is through examples. Yep. And I point out examples of people who are on everybody's records. Yeah. And then I ask the student, why do you think? You know, why is Lee Sklar on over, you know, I forget how many thousands of records, Nathan East, you know, and like I said, uh, you know, Chuck Rainey, James Jamerson, Pina Palladino. You know, these guys are working all the time because you don't know them as a soloist. Mm. Right? I was telling you earlier, I dug myself into a hole with my first solo record, A Show of Hands, yeah. which I hoped would be recognized for the musicality of it. But because I did it as a solo record, no other instruments, the bass players took it as a technical record. Mm. Yeah. And then with the growth of the Flectones, especially after we lost Howard Levy, when I started taking more solos, all of a sudden, I'm a soloist and a technical player when I grew up making people dance by playing bass lines. Yeah. So if you notice, if anybody follows any of my records, you'll notice every record I pulled back. I pulled back as far as this stuff. Yep. More bass lines, more bass lines, making the bass line the part of the song, not the solo. I will say you do both of those things incredibly well. And I remember as a kid, I was enamored by the technical facility and, oh my gosh, all this stuff on the bass that I had never heard. Sure. And that being said, I grew up, my dad is a weather report freak. Jocko uh, was in the car yes. on the CD player yeah. at least twice a week. Mm. So I grew up listening to Jocko. I grew up mm. listening to you know, stuff where it, it wasn't abnormal for me to hear a bass doing something really technical. But when I first heard your stuff, I was thinking, oh my gosh, that technique is insane. The playing is insane. I can't believe it's on a bass. But then immediately what I latched on to was the creativity. Mm -hmm. and, and this is something I don't, I don't think you get enough credit for, I'll tell you. I don't think you get enough credit for how creative you've been able to weave the technical, the groove, 
the bass lines, the solos all together. Because although somebody might watch your version of Amazing Grace mm -hmm. and think, oh my gosh, that's so cool on the bass, to recognize how creative you have to be, that song basically on the bass can be done in one key, sure. right? You have to figure, okay, the harmonics and the way right. that you do that and the right. way you do this, and then there's certain lines and there's a certain creative way of, okay, how can I take this incredibly beautiful, well-known melody and do something completely unique. Because mm -hmm. we've all done a version of Amazing Grace. Right. But all of my friends know yours, and yours <laughs> is the one that I pull up. Why? Because there's, of course, some really fun musical things that you do. But to me, the creativity of it is the most compelling. You set us up for certain things, right. it's really melodic, and then all of a sudden, it drops the groove. Mm -hmm. Okay, now he's just gonna groove a little bit. Nope, he's playing <laughs> the groove and the melody, and all this wee you know, yeah, all this yeah, extra yeah, stuff. Yeah. And then getting back into reharmonizing the melody with some groove, mm. bringing it back down. And then the, the <laughs> tuning thing at the end, I remember just thinking, yeah. oh, the playing was amazing, but how did he come up with those ideas? Mm. And that's something that I've noticed in a lot of sessions that I've been at is sometimes people don't leave enough space for creativity in their productions, but also especially in the bass chair. So if you, if somebody feels like they're being handcuffed a little bit, maybe by even their, themselves in their own mind, yeah. what are some ways you think that people can work on opening up their mind and opening up their creativity? One of the main things that I like to share with people is, is, is if we think about what music is. Like, like if I ask you, fill in the blank, Corey, music is, Art. Give me another word. Heart. Love. What else? Give me one more. Joy. Okay, notice you didn't say music is a guitar. Music is technique. Music is theory. Mm. Right? Without our instrument in our hands, we go right there. As soon as we pick this up, we forget those words. If that's what music is, that's what we should be playing every time we pick up the instrument. No, no, before we pick up the instrument. Right? It's that. That's deep. It's deep. Because it's right in front of our face. But, our yeah, but lives. it's right here. That's the thing. The most deep things are right in front of our face. It's, it's that simple. That's what we should be playing. That's what we should be teaching. That's what the audience wants to hear. They don't want to hear a technique. Nobody's yeah. dancing because the key song's in E-flat, right? <laughs> they're not dance, dancing to the key. They're dancing to a feeling, a, 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 a groove. They're going to walk home or drive home, leave with a feeling. They won't remember the notes or the techniques of the solo. They'll remember what everything felt like. If I tell you a story, you will remember that story. Mm -hmm. right? Not word for word, right? Even if we told the same story, Little Red Riding Hood, you're going to tell the same story with your own words. So people are going to remember your gig how they choose to. But the stories will be the same. So the big story for me on a given night is the whole show. Mm. The song or the first set or the second set is another story. It needs to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And it needs to take people somewhere. First set, second set should be a different story, not the same story. Every song is a story. The melody is a story. Your solo is a story. And they should all work independently, but make a bigger story when it's put together. Many people aren't telling stories they're saying a bunch of random sentences that they've practiced and the sentences don't line up to tell a story. Mm -hmm. Like for you and I, we say something that leads to the next sentence, that leads to the next sentence. The great players do that. If you listen to the old players, that's what they do. Willie Weeks, bass solo, since we're talking about bass. Donny Hathaway live, everything is everything. That's, yes, exactly. There's not a better building of a solo, at least a model of how to do it, where every sentence, every phrase leads to the next. If we can learn to do that, you don't have to be as good as you thought you did. Right? Wow. For, for example, Corey, I, sometimes I'll show people a pile of rocks, a picture of a pile of rocks, and I say, what is that, a pile of rocks? Then I show people a picture of an organized, like, you know, sculpture with rocks, and they say, what is that? And they, you see their eyes, go, well, that's a, you know. I say, if you look at each individual rock, it's no more beautiful than the pile of rocks. It's how those normal rocks were put together that makes it stand out. 
So people are trying to get every note right, every tone right, every bow right, and you don't have to, right? Willie Nelson doesn't know but five chords, and they're not always beautifully played, but Willie Nelson is in every one of those chords. Mm. Like Bob Dylan, can he really sing, right? And the answer is yes, but he wouldn't win The Voice, right? Mm. American Got Talent or whatever, he wouldn't win that. But the way he puts it together and the fact that he puts his whole self in everything he sings and plays, right? So we're trying to do it here mm -hmm. when nobody wants to hear this. You guys were playing the same, look like the exact same guitar today. <laughs> yeah. But you, know, you, sound, you sound like you got your own different voice. It literally is the same guitar. <laughs> okay, right? But, so then what makes you sound like you and him like him? It's, it's who you are that's coming through and that's what people pay to see. Mm. So in many cases, we're learning an instrument when you should be learning yourself. And then you express yourself through an instrument. And then if people, the realness of you will attach itself to the realness of anyone else. Right? And then you've got a fan or a listener for life. That's why you like Jocko. That's why you like the Fleck Tones. That's why you like, right? you don't like Jocko because he sounds like someone else. You like Jocko because he sounds like no one else. Mm. So even Bruce Lee, a Kung Fu man, said his whole thing about Kung Fu was... Uh, like a journey to the self. And then you express that in whatever way you choose. You choose the guitar, I choose the bass. But when I come hear you play, I don't want to hear your guitar. I want to hear you. Your wisdom in this comes out and the way that you teach is very unique and very appreciated by me. Your books, both of which I absolutely love, The Thank Music you. Lesson and The, the Spirit. Spirit of Music, yeah. which is a follow-up. Right. right. It's not a method book in the way that people would expect somebody to say, well, I, uh, do you want to explain? I, I want you to explain as much as well, you want for people to yeah, also sure. need to buy the book because <laughs> both of them are insane. Thank you, thank you. The idea of the book, especially the first book, is as a young student, it's like me, my character. Yeah. It's a young bass player. But, but I will say this, it, it's not totally me. I took a lot of people's troubles sure. and put them in yep. my character. A young bass player living in Nashville who's doing everything right, learning all the skills, practicing the techniques, you know, theory, but not getting gigs. Life in, in general, not that good and what's going on. And he's doing everything to try to figure it out. But one day he opens his eyes in his house and there's a man standing there. Michael. Michael. And you know, my character should be afraid someone's in your house, but he's not. So he just says, who are you? And Michael says, I'm your teacher. And he says, well, what can you teach me? And Michael, Michael says, nothing. <laughs> and that's what starts the whole journey where yeah. they learn everything. But you find out nothing is everything. And that's kind of the key. And, it, you know, Isis, one of the characters, starts talking about nothing and the number zero and space. Yeah. You know, because you don't have something without space. Music allows you to talk about anything without the hang-ups. Mm. Through music, I can talk about equality, inequality, religion, you know, sexism, whatever, but I call it music, fairness, you know. And so I wanted to use these books in a way to talk about more stuff through, through the medium of music so that people will receive it. Because people will receive music, yeah. you know. Uh, where if I, if I mention about, well, who'd you vote for? I'm already got my guard up of who your answer is going to be, you know, or what religion yeah. are you, or how much money you make. Music is not so much like that anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, yet, I should say. So I, I, I wrote fictional stories with real lessons. Yes. The lessons are real, the story's fake. Yeah. But I did it with, as fiction so I don't have to defend it. I love that. It immediately puts your own guard down, allows you to... <sighs> right, I can say what I want because I didn't say it, the character said it. <laughs> All right? I didn't say that. Michael said that, you know. I love but it's like that. going to watch Star Wars. You know, yeah. we don't have to fight over whether Luke is really Darth Vader's son or if there's really a green guy named Yoda. We just enjoy the story. Yeah. So I wanted to do that. But if you go watch any of those movies, the lessons are real. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. So I wanted to do something like that too, because students, after coming to my camps, were asking for a book. And for one, I don't want a Wooten method. Yeah. I don't want a uh, here's how to do it. Mm -hmm. I'll point you in some directions, you know, but when we learn to talk, you learn the same words I learned, but you know that you can use them how you want. Yeah. But we teach music in a way that you got to learn my way first. 
Mm. And then I tell you to go find your own voice. After I taught your voice out of you, I tell you to go find it again. <laughs> it's so silly and backwards. So I didn't want to do that. Yeah. So I wrote a story. But the lessons are in there. The lesson or the takeaway that I got from the second book was maybe a little bit less about the self yeah. and more about the world and how the self can explore the world. Maybe, maybe the first book, my interpretation, a little more of exploration of self. Absolutely. And then the second one, this is happening and this is how we can use, sure. now that we've found ourselves. this is how we can use that in the world. Beautiful, beautiful, good, great. You nailed it. Uh, the first book, I wanted people to not be afraid of music, mm -hmm. make friends with music, and well, I can do this, I can play. Yeah. You know, by giving them tools. N n normally we give people notes and a little bit of technique and yeah. tell, go play. Yeah. It's like teaching people 12 words and say, go speak a language, right? You can't speak with only 12 words, you can't speak music with only 12 notes. So this book gives you nine other things beside the notes. And that's where we broke music up into 10, 10 parts to make people say, I can do this. This is easy. Yeah. Now, why are you going to do it? That's what the second book is more. Not how to play, but why to play. And you have to involve other people when you ask any question of why. Mm. Can right? you expand on that a little bit? Any question why you want to do anything, right? And this, is, this came from my mom. She didn't say it exactly like that, but... I'll give you a mom story. My mom was the most praising parent I've ever seen. She always made you feel good and know who you were. But one day, I can't recall what I had done, but I was proud of myself. It could have been I had practiced for four hours because I've always hated to practice, still do. I was like, mom, and I don't know if this was it, but this is a good story. I said, mom, I, I practiced four hours a day. And she said, well, what's that got to do with me? And I went, whoa. That's right. That's just a selfish endeavor. What, you know? So I took the next long while to look at everything I did in life, everything, to see how it affected anyone else. Mm. How could it benefit anyone other than me? From tying my shoes, brushing my teeth, to practicing the bass, right? And I, got, I look at it this way because we are as good as we are on our instrument. Not only because we practice, but because of the people before us. Absolutely. If you mentioned Jocko, if Jocko didn't put in all that hard sweat and all that stuff, you wouldn't even be as good as you are on the guitar. Absolutely. So whether they know it or not, what they did affected us. Mm. And every other bass player in the world, whether you've heard of Jocko or not, you are affected by the people before you. Mm -hmm. Right. So my mom was making me aware of that. That you're not doing things just because of you. Nothing. Nothing from brushing your teeth to anything else. It affects everyone else when you can see it. Or whether you can see it or not, but when you're aware of that concept, you can be more conscious of everything you do. Mm. Right. Knowing that every vibration you put out there is a f is bumping off of something else. Like yeah. the notes we just played are still vibrating somewhere. Right. And knowing that my vibrations will never get taken back. Mm. OK. Once it's out there, it's out there. So I want to make sure I'm putting out at least consciously with the best effort to put out the best vibrations possible. So that's what I take away from my mom saying, well, what's that have to do with me? just because you practiced. Wow. Right? So you're good on the guitar. Good. So now what? What's that have to do with me? Right? Yeah. Are you good at the guitar to show me how bad I am? Is that your real purpose? Because at that point, it's, it's not a good reason to be good at the guitar. Yeah. But if you're helping what you are, other people, and for me, for me, Corey, what you're doing for me is reawakening the art and the importance and the gift of rhythm guitar. Well, thank you. Everybody wants to solo. <laughs> but man, the fact that I was telling you earlier that my daughter this morning was so excited. You're going to play with Corey Wong? <laughs> I'm thinking Corey Wong plays rhythm guitar. How do you know about him, right? <laughs> he don't sing, right? He don't dance. He don't like, you know. But that made me so happy. Made yeah. me so happy. So whether you realize it or not, you are helping 
the next whatever, 10 generations of guitars. Yeah. With what you're doing. So to me, that's a good reason to practice. I love that. It's a great motivator also to get better, to stay strong, but also to really just feel the weight of impact and influence. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, you know, let me add this, Corey. This is what the, uh, the other part of the Spirit of Music book is talking about. And this is part that, never, that will never get talked about, and we don't teach it, and I rarely talk about it in public, is that music, I'll say herself, mm -hmm. what we call music yep. needs us, mm. okay? Music needs us. In other words, music, I'll go ahead and say it how I feel it. Music exists. Like you can hear music in your head. I can't hear what you're hearing, but it exists without yeah. us. But to, for music to become physical on earth, it has to vibrate. It can't vibrate without us, right? In, in, in religion, they call it the Holy Trinity. You have music, you need two other things, a musician and an instrument, mm. right? You need a mother and a father for the baby to be born, okay? So for music to be born on earth, we need you and a guitar. Now you, without the guitar, it is, is this in your head. It's still there, it's still alive. You feel it, everything, but it's not vibrating yet. So now we need an instrument, whether it's a voice, we still need an instrument. Once it's born, it's vibrating. Music to exist on earth needs us for that. Mm. That's going away, that's dying. It's still vibrating, but there's less of a, there's, it's still vibrating, but there's much less of a vibration these days. Do you feel, which part of the Trinity do you feel is most hurting? I would say all of it's hurting, but the, 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 the thing that can change it is us, is mm. the being, Yeah. okay? So I think the instrument is, is just what it is. I don't know that that's hurting so much, but what can change, I, I don't really know. It could be, I don't know, but what can change it all is us, right? If you think about music, the way I explain it in the book, if you think about live music being 12 inches, right? Let's just, let's just signify live music, what we just played. You feel that, right? Yeah. Real drummer, real horns, right? 12 inches. Vinyl record might be eight inches, right? A CD made up of waveforms, let's say it's six inches. An MP3 is about a tenth the size of a waveform. So now we got six inches, now we're down to 0.6 inches, half an inch. Put that through tiny earbuds or a computer speaker, we might be down to a quarter of an inch. That quarter of an inch is what my kids think is normal. But that quarter of an inch is also quantized, so we're not getting all the rhythms. It's pitch corrected, we're not getting all the pitches. It's, it's, it's uh, compressed, we're not getting all the dynamics. Right? It's already going from this to this, and that's not even all there. And we think that's normal. Yeah. Right? And so where is it going to go from there? Mm. Right? So music still exists. The music's still good. Yeah. But it's just like food. If it doesn't have the nutrients, it doesn't matter what it tastes like. Mm -hmm. But it's also the fact that fast food is, costs less than, than food that's good for you. Yeah. Right? I can buy a, a two-liter bottle of cola cheaper than I can buy, buy an eight-ounce bottle of water. And we've been convinced that that's normal. Mm. We've been convinced that this is normal. So that's why in this book I'm portraying whoever decided this. I've per portrayed them as a, a group of people called phasers that are putting our yeah. lives out of phase, yeah. right? But it's up to us to remember, especially us that are old enough to remember what it really is. Mm. So if you think about what happens at a live concert, people forget their problems. Yeah. Right, when you take that rhythm guitar solo, which is unheard of, and I turn to the guy next to me, smack his hand, high five, and at that time, I'm not caring what the color of the skin is, who they pray to, who they voted for. We're just all celebrating your music. Mm. Live music does that. This makes me put on my headphones and listen by myself. Mm. Right, remember when we used to buy vinyl and we listen as a group? Now we buy a song. It was song. CDs for me, but yes. Well, <laughs> I remember yeah. putting it in the boom box. Right. And okay, okay, <gasps> exactly. Putting it in. And, <laughs> and playing it live. Before yeah. we bought a, I know Sonny can remember when we bought a vinyl, we all sat down together, listened to the whole vinyl. We didn't pick our favorite songs. Front to back, we passed around the cover so we could read every word. 
Yeah. But slowly, slowly, now we're down to, I don't even buy your whole, Scott Mulva Hill is here, great player. We don't buy the whole record, we buy, buy the song we want and listen to it out of order yeah. by myself. But I say I heard his whole record and I haven't yet. Mm. So I'd love for us to bring back, I don't know how to say it, because real music is there. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, it's great artists out there, but we're not, it, it's not reaching us in its entirety unless we go see it live. Mm. And I'd love to find a way of bringing that back, the appreciation, uh, even, even paying for music. Yeah. yeah. Don't even need to get into the discussion of the value of what that is. Right, right. Of what this is or whatever. And, yeah. and you're right. The, I think the experience of music, the way we experience it, creates a different visceral response. It like does. you said, Scott is here. Scott was on tour. With, you came to our show in oh, Boston. Yeah. Oh, yeah. When I watch Scott play the upright bass and sing, it does something to me on the inside that I don't get when I hear it on my headphones. Right. Or even when I hear it on a dope stereo at my studio or whatever, right. it just hits me different. Exactly. So I'm seeing, I'm seeing the nuances of, I can see every, when he goes on his upright. Right. I can see all three of the, four of those fingers, sure. whatever, doing that. And then I see the string hit the fretboard. Mm -hmm. Hearing Sonny talk about listening to records as a kid. Oh yeah, Prince used to come at the house. There was this, uh, this, he was just telling us about this film soundtrack of, that Quincy did for, what movie was that? Pawnbroker. The Pawnbroker. Mm. He was mm. showing us, he's like, oh no, pull, it, pull this up. He's like, ah, it doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound right. Oh, this different version. He's like, oh, check this out. This is when we first learned about strings. Uh, we listened, we sat up until 6 a.m. and just mm. listened to this back to back to back. When I think, when he was telling us about that experience, I was thinking, oh my gosh. When my friends and I are thinking about, oh, let's get into string arranging, mm -hmm. right? Like, oh, we're just going to get into string arranging tonight, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Or if you want to just get into some of that space to kind of inspire, oh, this is how we can weave lines with our guitars and with yeah. the horns and the percussion, all, yeah. all of it. I go and I pull up Spotify and it's just, okay, here's this album. Okay, cool, here's this one. It's not just... Let's, okay, here's this Quincy record. Let's listen to it. Just listen to the violins. Okay, let's go back. Let's listen to the violas. Let's listen to the low end. All, All right. this. You know, there's a different experience and there's a, a different level of absorption. Yes. And I think the same goes with the things going on around us mm -hmm. where pretty much every time I get in a car if I'm not driving... I'll pull up my phone and, okay, I got some things I got to tend to, or, oh, let me see what's happening in the world, rather than just sitting there and looking around, yeah. like when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we absorb the world in a different way, and it's, it still feels very new. It is, it, it is very new. It's very, very new. This technology that we're talking about is very, very new. I mean, when I was young... You know, Star Trek was the only people that had cell phones, you know, and, and theirs was a flip phone. So now they're outdated. Right. <laughs> you know, when they would do this and beam me up, it was a flip phone. So now, I mean, it's, it's really, really new. The, the thing is, is that, you know, and I don't want to be the old guy talking about how it used to be. Sure. Yeah. It's you don't but, come across that way. It's good. I hope not. But I see the separation it's bringing to the world. It's where, you know, we used to get in on a car ride or sit in our home and talk to each other. Now everybody's here. Mm -hmm. Everybody on the subway train is here or, you know, or at the concert, people are watching your concert like this. You're right there playing, but I'm watching it through this thing so I can take it home and, and post it. That's more important than experiencing you in the moment. Right. So when we can become so distracted, the people, the things that are distracted or rather the people who are distracted because people are making these things, they can determine what distracts us. Mm. And that's scary. That's scary. Very scary. Where it used to be, you lived on the farm, you just send the kids outside. You didn't know what they were doing. They were being creative. You didn't have to worry. Yeah. But they're playing with a stick. They're playing on top of the hay bales. You know, the mind is creative, and then you grow up to be creative people. 
this kind of thing doesn't grow, doesn't have us grow up to be so creative, creative mm -hmm. in a different way. Sure. Yeah. Right. And I, and I hate to quant quantify whether it's good or bad because I yeah. can't see the future. You may yep. find out, oh, this was perfect. But what I see is people who follow rather than think for themselves. I see a lot more of that. And my parents were all about us using this thing, yeah. making us think. When we thought we had it, they would congratulate us for having it, but then push us to get it more. This is what my mom, who was always, like I said, always praising until that day, she said, well, what's that have to do with me? Okay, you practice. Good, now what? Why are you practicing? And that was my first inkling of not how to play, but why to play. Mm. You know? I think I want to close by asking advice. In the mm -hmm. beginning of this, you talked about being somebody who's got a lot of experience and happy to have that experience. Mm -hmm. When you see this change, this sort of environment, the way that we're doing things now, with your experience, how would you suggest the people in my generation protect their creativity and protect their sense of identity? A few things. One is we always tell young musicians to go find your voice. You don't have to find your voice. You have it. You don't sound like anyone else but you. You try to sound like Jocko, you sound like you trying to sound like Jocko. You don't sound like Jocko. The main thing is recognize what makes your voice your voice. And the best, best voice we have that's most us is our speaking voice. How did you get it? Through practice? Through analyzing other voices and then sitting in a room and practice? No, you got it through speaking your mind. Mm. So with musicians, you wanna be able to play freely, okay? The way I get most people, I trick pe most people, especially at Berklee College of Music where I get to teach every month, Sometimes I have to trick these jazz musicians into freeing up by telling them to take the worst solo ever. Mm. Yeah, and when they take the worst solo, first just even thinking about it, they get a smile on their face, which is a no-no in jazz, right? <laughs> so they immediately start, start smiling, but then their freedom is there because there's no model on how, bad, how to play badly. But we're all trying to follow this model of what we think good is, and it's in this small box. Right. But it's when Jocko broadens the box that we look. It's when Hendrix broadens it. It's yeah. when Tony Williams broadens. Yeah. And the people we love are outside of the box. Right. But you're born with a fingerprint that's never been here and will never be here again. So you're you're already not in a box. You're already unique. You have something no one else in the history of humankind ever will have. So you're a gift. But our job what we're told is to learn someone else's gift before, and then we got to go back and find this. So this is the proof that you're born special. It means you've got your own voice, you have your own ideas, you have everything the world needs right here. No one tells you that. You have to learn someone else's gift first. So my first thing with people is showing them and having them realize how special they are, not because of what they do, but because they were born. Mm. Just because you were born. Out of all the choices at that instant, life chose you. Which means you've already won the biggest contest, the biggest lottery, anything you could ever enter to win, you've already won it. Not because of what you do now. It's because of what's already been done. So now what you do is up to you. And regardless of whether you do anything, you could, like I tell people, you could lounge on your couch for 100 years. No one can take that victory away. There's the proof. No one can take it away. You've already won. You're already special. But what makes it better, and this is what my parents taught us, is we get to choose what to do with our specialness. Right? So this is all about how can I express my specialness? Mm. And I'm lucky enough, Corey, to have learned this very, very young. It's not about the bass. Yeah. It's not about, really not about anything. It's just that I get to express who I am, right? And in me expressing who I am, it's going to make you want to express who you are. I love right? that. And so that for me is what it's, it is what it's really about. It's what it's really about. And, and now, I, I, I don't know if I could say more than ever, 
It's just that we still need that awareness yeah. that you are enough. Reg- not, not because of what you do, because of who you are. Right? Mm. You're someone's child. Whether they loved you ever or not, you're still there. Something chose you to be born. Right now, people of you, we've kind of found who we are and are expressing that. And whether we realize it or not, we are helping the universe. We are helping people, even if it's just for that two hour concert that they get to escape. Yeah. Something else. We are helping them. And the more real and in tune we can be with who we are, it's going to attach itself and be attracted to the realness of who someone else is. And they may not even know why they love you, but they will. The way you're talking about this and the way that you're talking about, when I think about this, I'm thinking about how and where we wrap our identity. Mm -hmm. And um, because you're talking in this way, I think you are the perfect person to ask this question to or for, for people to hear from you Some folks wrap their identity in their technical proficiency and think that it's never going to go away. They think, I practice eight hours a day and till the time I die, I'm just going to keep getting better and nothing can take that away from me. Mm -hmm. And they wrap their entire identity, their entire sense of self, possibly even their own sense of Mm self-worth to how fast or clean they can play 16th note runs or right. whatever. Right. And don't tie their identity to anything else. For those, I think you know where I'm going with this, for those that think that that will never be taken from them or that that'll never go away, do you have any words of wisdom for those that might? Sure. Anything you do can be taken away. Anything you do, and if you define yourself by what you do, you're going to struggle. And I saw a lot of my musician friends struggle during the pandemic because we couldn't get out and do what we do. Mm -hmm. And if you define yourself by what you do, you're lost when you can't do it. But no one can take away who you are. Right? No one can take away your fingerprint. Yeah. Right? If you touch something, it's like a barcode in a store. They can tell what item touched it. Just because of that, that's how special we are. No one can take that away. So when you exist from the core of who you are, not what you do, Mm -hmm. right? What you do is just a representation or an expression of who you are. No one, no thing can take away who you are. I would even go as far as to say not even death can erase who you really are. Because who you really are existed the same way music exists before it becomes physical. Right? I may, I may uh, uh, make a lot of people mad when I say this. You existed before you became physical also and will continue to exist. Not, maybe not in the same form. But, and again, I'm really quoting in my own way my mom and my dad. Because they, they knew what five black boys, I'm the youngest of five boys, they knew what we were facing in the 50s and 60s. Mm-hmm. Right. They knew that we would, might be existing in a world that didn't support us. So we had to know who we were. We had to support each other as brothers. So we never fought. Never. We weren't even allowed to argue. Mm-hmm. We were in a band. Right. And a band is, for me, the best thing on earth to show how the world should exist. Right. The band is better when all the instruments are different, not the same. Mm. Right. An orchestra of flutes will sound good. But it's not the same as an orchestra with a bunch of different instruments. Yeah. Right. Before we play, we make agreements. Right. Nobody's here to win above everyone else. We don't win unless we all win. Right. We make a ton of agreements before we even play music. The people who listen are here to agree. The people who don't want to agree didn't come. You know, so music is powerful that way. It brings people together. So our parents wanted us to get good at it. Right. Because of what it does. Right. But. It's who we are that we are expressing, right? And once you know who you are, there's nothing that can take you, that away from you. So you're never lost. But we have to be f- careful because life is trying to erase who you are. We've mm-hmm. heard it over and over. Leave your ego at the door. For everyone at home, look up the word ego, E-G-O. Look it up. You'll find out ego means a sense of self. Ego means knowing who you are. 
I hired you because of who you are. Anyone plays guitar, but I hired Corey Wong today. Why would you leave Corey Wong at the door? Mm. You never want to leave your ego out the door. Now, you don't want an inflated ego. As soon as my self-worth is more important than yours, now there's a problem. Yeah. But that's a small part of the ego. But we, put, we lump the whole word ego into that, and then people tell you to leave it. So we're not really taught to know who we are. There's very little, very little in society, especially education, that is built upon knowing who you are first. Right? Through all the school, you've had to do book reports, you've had to study, you had to interview people. When have you ever done a book report on yourself? When have you ever been told to interview yourself? When have you ever transcribed your own solo and it's just as good as anyone else, even if you've only been playing two years? You never told that. So everything we learn from outside of ourselves is about other people. Mm -hmm. So we're taught to find ourselves through other people. I'm lucky enough that for me as a kid, it was reversed. You find yourself first and then come talk to me. That's the way my parents did it. That's beautiful. Amazing. Vic, thanks so much for being here. This is an absolute treat. I have so much to think about. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I got to come to your camp. Please do. Co oh, let's do it. Let's make I want to come to your camp. Oh, you said it twice, so that means it's on. I'm, I'm there. Okay. All right. I'm there. I'm going to be there. Oh, my Great. gosh. Thank you so much. What Thank a treat. You. Thank you this so really much. This really means a lot. Thank you.